All right, before I start the sermon, one more little point that I forgot in the announcements is that there are, are going to be uh, cupcakes available after service. So Mrs. Johnson was kind enough to bring in some cupcakes for Leslie's birthday to celebrate. And I guarantee you, you could be a blessing if you want to get those. So make sure you get out there and get one because um, I, I could guarantee you they're going to be wonderful. So appreciate that. And uh, they are gonna, they're out on the table. I can see them right now. So feel free to help yourself to one of those after the service. But now you, you got you to hold back and refrain until after the service, just like the prizes. Okay, you got to wait till we're done and then go get one. All right. Um, now, my sermon for this morning... Sometimes you have to do things you don't really like doing. Sometimes I have to do things I don't really like doing. Okay, there's an issue that came up recently. And, you know, I apologize for those of you who are visiting the church that you're going to have to go through this and deal with this. But it's something that's happened. It's something that came up. Um, I don't think it's too big of a deal. Um, but I'm going to, we're going to cover it right now out and open. And I'm going to bring up, basically, I've had an accusation against me. And there is someone who is now withdrawn themselves from our church over this accusation. So I want to start off by making sure that things are being done decently and in order in this church, first and foremost. Okay, and remind everybody, as we started off in 1 Timothy chapter 5, I'll get to the accusation in a minute, so just hold tight. But in verse number 1 of 1 Timothy chapter 5, I want you to look down there. The Bible says, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren. Now, as you continue to read, I believe that the primary application of this passage, and you keep going, it's for the, the younger men, the younger, or the older men, the younger men, older women, younger women, that were treating each other appropriately just in general in the church. And when it's talking about an elder here, the primary application, the first surface application is an older man, like physically aged, older, that you treat that man with respect. But I completely also believe that this applies to spiritual elders or someone who is called an elder in the church as well. Someone who holds the position of a pastor is also synonymous with someone who is an elder. So the way that you treat, if you believe that you have a pastor that's in error about something, is not to rebuke them but rather to entreat them as a father. And you think about, what does that mean? It's like, you don't have to call me father. That's not what it's saying. I'm not a priest. I'm not a Catholic priest. I don't call myself father. It's the level of respect that a person ought to have for their father. When you think about how a son would approach their father, it ought to be with some fear and reverence and, and a little bit of, of you know, in treatment of going, hey, Dad, you know, I, I, I'd like to talk to you about something, you know, there's, and, and be gentle in your approach when you think there is a problem with something. Now, that's just kind of starts off this passage, right? That that's the way that people ought to be bringing things up. Now, obviously, look, it, there, there's a limit, okay? If, if someone's just like, if you have a pastor that's out committing adultery, Okay, you don't have to be very gentle about a sin like that. Okay, something that's just grievous sin. But in general, that shouldn't be happening anyways, right? And those aren't the things we're talking about. And look, no pastor is perfect. We're, we're, we're human beings, sinful, just like everybody else. And, and I hope I've never come across as being a holier-than-thou type of person. I don't think I have, but, you know... If I have, I'll tell you right now, you know, I'm not perfect. My family's not perfect. We have our own sins, our own problems that we deal with, deal with the flesh on a daily basis like everyone else, okay? But when we jump down, I want you to jump down to verse number 17 there because now that being understood and that being said, so I, I want to make this clear. So if anyone has a problem or sees a problem with me or my family, this is how you approach someone, especially an elder, about this about a problem that you see or that you're concerned about, okay? Because I don't want to come off today as, as being this, you know, just super angry and, and make everyone just feel like, man, I can't ever say anything to Pastor Burson. I don't want you to feel that way. You ought to be able to say, if, you, if something's on your mind, if you're concerned about something, if you, if you see some problem, you think there's some, some problem in my life that I need to deal with, 
that maybe I'm blind to, then by all means, let me know, but do so appropriately. Verse number 17, Bible says, let the elder, so in this passage, now we're, we're talking about the pastor. We're talking about people who are ruling in the house of God, not just someone who is aged in the house of God. This is someone who's ruling. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Verse number 19, against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Okay, so if someone's going to start coming to you and talking about some accusation that they have against a pastor, you need to not receive that accusation unless you've got other people around, two or three witnesses, that can verify what's being said. Now, it doesn't mean you can't receive an accusation, but you have to have other people around. You can't have this one person tells one person, and it's kind of like this scuttlebutt, this, this you know, war, just things just being talked about in private, because that's how, that's how church splits happen. That's how deceitful workers work. They don't want to be out in the open and upfront about it and let everybody know what's going on. They're going to be more subtle about it and sneaky and trying to get into the ear of different people and kind of play how much can I talk to this person about? Am I going to be able to, are they going to go for this or not? So, so they test the waters and then try to poison the minds of, of multiple people. That's, that's why this is in place. Because if you have something to say, if you have an accusation against someone, you ought to just be able to say, yeah, that's fine. Let's get a few other people out here so everyone can hear what I have to say. And then that way, when it comes time to deal with an accusation, Yes, I witnessed them say that. Yes, I, I witnessed that. I heard them say, this is what they said. Every word could be established. So there's not the, oh, well, I didn't see that. You know, people trying to backpedal. Well, I didn't say that. Well, yes, you did, because we've got other people that heard you say that very thing. So that everyone can be held accountable for things that you make accusations about. I mean, it makes sense, right? Because if you're going to make an accusation about something, you better make sure you're right about it. Right. And you better be able to stick to it. And you better not be going and saying more then you know to be fact. So it, this keeps people in line about just making frivolous accusations. So then you can deal with it. And then it says there in, um, in verse number 20, them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. So if people are bringing false accusations and it turns out that this is all just a bunch of nonsense, he says, you know what, rebuke them before all that everybody else is going to hear and fear and be like, okay, well, you know, I don't want to be brought into shame because I'm bringing an evil report against people that there's nothing, no foundation there. Now, I don't know if this has happened or not. I have no idea. I'm bringing it up because it may have, it may not have. I'd like to think that the person who's no longer attending our church has the integrity, and I do think he does, and I think he's just completely wrong about this. And I'll explain why as soon as we get into that in just a minute. But um, just in case there was any other communication going on that I'm not aware of, I just want to make sure that everyone's full well aware of what the Bible says about receiving accusations. Okay? So if you were privy to this and you know what's going on and you, you were in conversations uh, about this with, by, by receiving accusations, you know, you ought not to do that. Okay, and if, and if you were, you know, in, in the future, if you were to become, does this there happen? You, know, no, you can't change the past. If you received accusation, okay, you know, I'm not mad at you, but we need to understand what the Bible says. And, and then in the future, be able to say, look, if you're going to be bringing up some type of accusation or some type of evil report against the pastor, we need to have a couple more people here to hear this and stop them in their tracks and say, this is what we need to do to do it right. Okay, and you know what, some people say, I don't know, I don't really want to say that, I don't really like when people even bring it up. Anyways, yeah, I don't either, but you need to stop it, right? So if someone's going to just be gossiping or bringing up railing accusations, it's not comfortable, but you need to stop it. 
it's not comfortable for me to stand up here and deal with this. I'd much rather have a much more joyful, hey, exciting, we got the camp coming up, I'm all fired up, this is great, let's have a good time and just get everybody motivated and, and edified. But you know what? We got to deal with this. I didn't choose to, to bring this issue up, but we're going to deal with it. And you know, you could still be edified because you're in a church where we're just going to deal with this stuff and we're going to look at the scripture and deal with what it says. So let's get to the accusation. Turn, if you would, to, to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Just go back a couple pages to chapter 3. Because this is why this person is, has withdrawn himself from our church. 1 Timothy chapter 3 gives the quality. Verse number one, the Bible says, man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into condemnation of the devil. So, what I've been accused of is one that doesn't rule his own house well because my children are not in subjection with all gravity. Now, this is what came up. I had a phone call with the person, and, um, and honestly, who it is doesn't even really matter right now because... This accusation, I'm covering it as a serious accusation, okay, and I want to make sure there wasn't anything else going around, so I'm just dealing with it head on. But this person, I want to let you know too, isn't kicked out of our church. Okay, and I want him to know that too. He's not kicked out and not to come to our church because he feels like I'm in violation of this, okay? Now, if he, you know, believes that in his heart, then he ought not to come to church. But I think it's ridiculous. <laughs> Pastor Rosens, your household is out of line, and you do not have your children in subjection. And, and I'm, and you know, maybe you're not feeling comfortable in front of everybody. But I kind of was taken aback because I was like, of all the, th you know, of all the things and all the reasons and all the things not to come, like, wait, what? <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> it's weird. Yeah. And, and just to be sure, there were two men, and I asked on Wednesday night, just like, I just want to make sure, like, I'm not just completely blind, that, that I just don't have these blinders on. You know, and they verified for me, too, and said, no, Pastor Burson's, it's not, that's not the case. Now, we'll go into this, and I want to go into this more in detail, too, because when we're talking, even just the qualifications for a bishop or for a pastor, you know, when it, when it says that they need to be blameless, first of all, like, like, you can take this stuff and run and go wild with it. Like, well... I mean, if you take it to its extreme, blameless can just be sinless, right? Because they're like, well, I mean, you're not perfect, so you have blame. So no one could be a pastor. And that's stupid. That's stupid. And why would it even say that? Because no one could be blameless. Obviously, there's a degree of being blameless. There's a, there's a, there's a reputation that you have. There's a how do you deal with people? Are you fair? Are you just, right? That's how you're blameless. Are you just known as being a crook? In your business, even outside of church, like, are you just some crooked person? You're always cutting corners and not, you know, like, well, that, that's not really blameless then. But you have to take into consideration that the pastor, while, yes, there are qualifications, is still a human being and still deals with the flesh. So when you're in, and, and the people that were brought up as being in, in a, having a problem are ages seven and younger. as what the problem is. Is there any parent here that has children that are older than seven 
that might have told a seven-year-old to do something once and they didn't do it. Has, any, has that ever happened to anyone? No? Am I the only one back there? All right, somebody has had a cell. Okay, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> You're probably thinking, like, well, Pastor Rosen, that's ridiculous. Of course, that's why we're not raising our hands, because everyone that has young children knows that they're not perfect all the time. Okay, and someone who has witnessed, we all, you told Jonathan to sit down somewhere, and he didn't do it. Like, okay. I don't even remember that. It wasn't a big deal, obviously. If I said to do something at church, you know, I've got a million other things going on. If he didn't do something that I said, whatever. If, if it was a big enough deal, I would have dealt with it. But if it's something that's stupid, mm -hmm. I don't even care. And, there's, and I'm not even going to bring up all the little details because they're dumb. Actually, I'm going to bring up a couple of them, though, because there, there's one thing. <laughs> well, beca because this is what it's going to all boil down to. So it starts with this not having my family in subjection, right? Not being, but then it really, all it really is going to boil down to is discipline, is how we discipline our children, okay? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover that as well. But first, I want to just cover this and, and look at the scripture here. When the Bible says in verse 4, 1 Timothy 3, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Okay, gravity is seriousness, right? When, when I tell my children to do something, in general, okay, they listen to what I say. And the more you want to be able to judge whether or not a, if a person's ruling his family well, you start looking at the older children. Before you look at the two-year-old, or the three-year-old, or the four-year-old, or the fight, you know, why don't you start looking at some of the older ones and see how they behave themselves? Right. Man, my children are not perfect, but I'll happily put Elizabeth and Abigail, who are 13 and 11, up for anyone to scrutinize and to say, where are they not being in, in subjection? Where are they just being really rebellious and stubborn and not coming to church or anything like that? Like, where is that happening? It doesn't. Because whether I'm at home or whether I'm here, my will is done. Amen. Which, uh, which is why I was just so, really? Like, if I am okay, no, 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 if I am okay with my level of control, why are you worried about? Someone not do, you know, what the perception is, maybe it's like, you better have these robots or have them. So, and, but here's, here's the real concern. Because there are, I, I've seen this before. When you have an, they might have their child like on a leash of just like, like not you know, having a cold stare and just doing literally exactly everything that they're told to do because they are fearful for their life. But that is not what the Bible is talking about by having your, your, your family or children in subjection with all gravity. Okay, because I, I, that, that does happen where people are just so, so severely, you know, punish their children that they won't, I mean, they won't even blink without be, being given permission to blink. And that's crazy. Okay, yep. and when you have younger children, they need to be able to be children. You need to be able to extend some mercy too, right. and have some grace and long suffering as you raise them and rear them up and you train them. It's not all just every single infraction is get the rod, get the rod, get the rod. Every single time there's any little minor infraction or any time they do or say something wrong. Okay, that's nuts. The Bible says here, having children in subjective without gravity, and then, and then it gives the, the, the reasoning behind this. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Basically, if you can't run things at home, if you can't run the house, manage the house, look, there's a lot of things that need to be done at home. 
right? There's a lot of tasks that need to be done. Children need to be taught. The house needs to be kept care, taken care of. Bills need to be paid. There's all different things going on at home. And when you're running a house, you need to be able to take charge and make sure things get done, right? And if you can't do that at home, how are you going to step up to a bigger responsibility and be able to take care of a church where, yes, we're all brothers and sisters, but there's still, you got to feed, right? As a pastor, you've, you've got to be able to feed and provide knowledge and teach and train and, and, and do a lot more in regards to the, the, the maintenance of the church. So if you can't even keep things under control at home, how are you going to do that in the church? And I would say this, and this is what I said. I said, well, look, because that's the reason why you need to have, like, if, if the one is out of order, you can guarantee the other is going to be out of order. If I can't keep my household running, how in the world would I ever be able to keep a church operational and, and functioning? And I said, are, are you calling the question the way that I run the church? Because I haven't had anyone question my authority ever. In fact, I've dealt with things that other people wanted to maybe do some things different, and I put my foot down and said, no, and guess what? My way is the one that, that went forward. Okay? And you know what? I think happily, too. Because I'm not trying to be a jerk and, and lord over everybody here, which is why at the beginning of the year when I'm asking for volunteers for all these different ministries, we've had more participation than ever. We have tons of people that are w interested in volunteering and wanting to do work and volunteer their time and sacrifice their time for the benefit of the church. I, I, would, like to I would hope that that speaks a little bit to my leadership here and being able to run things. Right. That people actually care are involved in the church. I mean, I, things are running. We've got, we've got our live streams always going up. The music's in great order. I mean, hey, praise the Lord for the music, right? The ministry. We've got people who are playing very well and praising the Lord, the, city, you know, the order, the, the service is being run in order, what's, what's the problem? If we're not seeing any, any you know, big problem. But on top of that, turn if you were to Titus chapter 1. Because, you know, you might want to play around a little bit with having your children in subjection with all. If they disobey, then they're not, they're, it's not all gravity. Give me a break. I mean, seriously, give me a break. Can you, can you give your pastor a break for not being perfect, for not having children that just listen to every single word that just drops out of my mouth and just will always do exactly what I say every single time? But we get from a pair of occasions for a bishop, I think a little bit more understanding of, of how far, how extreme should we take having your children in, in subjection with all gravity. Verse number five, the Bible says, for this cause left I thee in Crete that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, so there's the same qualification being blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children not accused of riot or unruly. So this is the similar part to having your children in subjection with all gravity. They're not accused of riot or unruly. Now, that word riot, first of all, what does that mean? Well, it's not used very often in Scripture. Okay, but being accused of riot, I'll give you a few of the examples here. You don't have to, you can turn it if you'd like to, but you don't have to. 1 Peter chapter 4. Verse number three, the Bible says, For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and ab abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. So this is talking about the contrast between Sinners out in the world, unsaved people, and the difference between them and you who is not living that life in the flesh anymore. So being in the flesh, he, it brings up this excess of riot is lasciviousness, it's lusts, it's excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, basically just partying it up and just living it up to the extreme. That's, that's riotous living. Proverbs 23, 20 says, Be not among wine-bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh. For the drunkard, which would be the wine-bibber, 
and the glutton, which would be the riotous eaters of flesh, shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. Deuteronomy 21.18 gives the law about, this is actually a death penalty, verse number 18, the Bible says, if a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father, there's your unruly. Unruly means you can't rule over them. will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him, will at all. Then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out unto the elders of the city and unto the gate of his place, and they shall say unto the elders of the city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. Look at this. He is a glutton and a drunkard. It mentions the gluttony and the drunkard, that's your riot and unruly. Okay, this is a shame. This is a disgrace to have a child that's in that condition. And they say they're just given over. Now, look, first of all, do you think a seven-year-old is going to be accused of riot and unruly? I would hope not. <laughs> He's a drunkard and a glutton and good for nothing and doesn't respond to it. Look. This is what the Bible's talking about, about having your house in order. Because if you get a microscope and focus on anybody's life, you're going to find some disobedience. Amen. You're going to find not everyone's perfect. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, there's a reason why when we go out in every single time, and I'm not, I don't want to brag or lift myself up. But if, if this is happening, it's kind of like, well, which one's true? All these random people who don't know me at all that just decide to approach me while I'm eating dinner, that want to give me a compliment and tell me, wow, your kids are so well behaved. Or someone in our church that wants to accuse me of having children that are riot and unruly, apparently. Oh, well, that's not what he said. I just said that you, you don't have your children in subjection without gravity. Same thing. If you look at the parallel passage, the same thing. That's what it's talking about, okay? My kids are not perfect. Neither am I. But what standard are you going to set for the qualifications of a pedal? How close do you want to look at this and say, nope? I mean, good luck finding your unicorn church. It doesn't exist. You want to find someone that has that level of... <laughs> but now we're going to get to where I think was... Because this is why with Drew as well, I mean, that's a serious thing, right? That, that you know, a pastor doesn't have his, his house in order and, and not ruling well. That gives you the reason to then, to then leave, but it seemed to stem upon further discussion from they just didn't like the discipline measures that were being put forward by my wife during church services. Okay, Because believe it or not, now this is coming from someone who has a husband and a wife sitting with many less children than what we have. But when my wife is sitting there by herself, because I'm up here, okay, and dealing with all of the children, it's not always easy if you need to take one of them out, especially one of the middle ones, and just leave everyone else behind. You don't want to cause more disruptions. Or you can get everybody up and walk out, and then there's another disruption. So it's kind of like there's always going to be some level of disruption. But it doesn't mean that the children aren't getting disciplined. But here's the problem is that it's anyone who's been coming to my church knows that I teach and thoroughly believe in the teaching of the Bible in terms of Proverbs chapter 13 that states that we ought to be using the rod on our children to correct them.
I have taught this and believed this from b- since before I had children. And this is totally biblical and scriptural. It's what the Bible says has been going But what we're going to see real quick, and part of the accusation is being hypersensitive on the definition of a rod. This person actually told me that, well, if you use any other discipline other than a rod that's not scriptural, it's not biblical, and you shouldn't do it. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear that. I hear that from people who have children, who have more. Not only just, a ro- and he's not just talking about inflicting physical punishment. If you use your hand, nope, not biblical, can't do it. If you were to use any other instrument than a rod, not, not biblical. Well, you know what's funny about that is this same person had a wooden cooking spoon. Well, you know, a cooking spoon isn't a rod. So I guess that's not biblical either, is it? I mean, if you really want, because they said, well, well, now you're on a slippery slope. I mean, if you start saying that, because I said, look, there's other means that are appropriate. Mm. I am all for using the rod, and we do that, and we give our kids spankings. Absolutely. Yes. Yes, 100%. You should not be sparing the rod either. But that's not the only means of discipline that you can use biblically as a parent okay there are other forms of punishment that you can give your children that are acceptable and fine and work now you can't leave out you shouldn't leave out the rod okay but i'm going to say i'm a couple things the rod is not just a literal physical rod as the only instrument of being able to meet out that punishment, (laughs) okay? I'm okay with the paddle that isn't a rod. I'm okay with the belt that isn't a rod. You're doing the same exact thing, okay? Anything that is not going to cause injury, because you don't want to injure your child, at all. We don't want to, you know, definitely break bones or, or things like that, but we want to inflict the pain that goes along with the spanking to, to show and to, to drive it home into the child's head. We shouldn't be doing that. Now, the Bible, multiple places. So Proverbs 13, 24, the Bible says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Okay? Now, I- if you're sparing your rod, the Bible says you hate your son. And look, I've taught on this before, and I still believe this to be true, <laughs> that if people are not using, you know, the, the, the corporal punishment as discipline, you don't really love your child. Now, you can start to apply this and say, look, we shouldn't be sparing the rod. Oh, I'm too busy. I've got other things going on. Yes, that's true. But again, how far are you going to take this to where it's like, okay, so one time, if I don't spank my child the way you say I should spank him, and at the moment that you say I should do it, does that mean I hate my son? No, no, we, we, you know, early, we believe every word, we look to the word of God, and we treat the Bible with as much reverence and respect and try to do everything as, pos- as, as to the T as possible, but we also have to come with a brain and common sense in order to, to get the, the right understanding, not dismissing what the Bible says, but taking it as a whole, with the spirit of the law and not just the letter of the law. What, what pops off to me right away is healing on the Sabbath day. 
Oh, you're working because you're healing. He's, he's healing. What can possibly be wrong about healing on the same? Like, it's not. He even tells them, look, you guys are able, you, you're, you do circumcision if the eighth day happens to be a Saturday, don't you? Well, that could be, oh, well, that's work. Oh, well, now we, look, no, it's not. It's an obedience to law. Well, you know what? Healing stuff. If someone were to get, like, maybe mortally wounded on the Sabbath day, what, are you just going to let them die? That's stupid. That's not the intention of God's law. That's, you know, God's not going to say, well, you can't lift up that person now. He fell into a ditch. He fell on a stake. He fell into a trap accidentally. And if you leave him there, he's going to die. Well, I can't lift them up out of there because then I'd be doing work. That's stupid. Okay, that's not taking the spirit. This is what the Pharisees were basically, their attitude was towards Jesus Christ. Okay, and it's the same type of a stupid attitude when you can't read the Bible and glean the understanding about disciplining your child. And you start to get so hyper that it's not biblical. Now, we are not a church idea of using an instrument to punish your children at all. Like I said, it's found all throughout Scripture. Proverbs 22, we read Proverbs 22, or excuse me, Proverbs 13. Proverbs 22, 15 says, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. The rod's driving it away. Proverbs 23, 13 says, Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Amen. Amen. And look, for those of you that don't know, I do do this with my children. <laughs> now, are you going to try how often? I, is, it, is it right to your standards? Is, is that how you're going to now judge? Like, well, I don't think you're ruling your house well. I would have spanked him in that instance, and you didn't. Okay. How about you show a little bit of grace and, and, and allow for people to come up to their, you know, how about you rule your family and I rule my family? And I got some going like, how much are you looking at my kids during service instead of just paying attention yourself? I mean, it got so bad, he's talking about how my child looks at my wife. Like, what do you, what do you care if one of my children has a smirk on his face or is, is pouting because they got in trouble and is angry with my, well, what do you care? What does that mean for anything? But it, it, you know, it leads me down this path of going, well, I mean, are you going to beat your child bec you know, over some look that they got because they got in trouble? I don't know. I mean, that's some people do that. I don't. Give a little bit of mercy. And, and depending on what they did, too. I mean, if it's something just really stupid, and then they give you a dirty look because they're upset, whatever, man. That's not with us about just every single slight infraction, you just beat them with the rod. You have to weigh, you have to judge what they're doing. In the Proverbs 13 that we read there, he has spared his rod, hated his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. When you start early on with this discipline, you don't need it that much later on. I almost never spank my older children. Almost never. Because they don't need it. Does that mean they're perfect? No but they're not really doing anything anymore that's going to require that level of discipline. And if they do, they get it. But when you do it early, they already know. And they don't want to have that. They've learned enough. You learn enough early on, and you just don't want to keep going back to that. Some kids learn a little bit faster than others, but, you know, they all ultimately will learn. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, Verse 15, the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings his mother to shame. 
And it says in verse 17, correct thy son and he shall give thee rest, thy soul. So I am not against the rod at all. It's scriptural. It's biblical. But what we didn't like was my wife pinched the hand of one of my children. A firm squeeze to let them know, stop messing around in church. Am I way out of line here? Like, Pastor Burzens, you are so unbiblical of just whipping out the rod, going and, and getting a switch off the tree and just beating them right then and there because they were starting to act up a little bit in church. Is it, I mean, is, is, am I just crazy here? Good, because I didn't think so either. Because my response when I was on the phone was incredulu in incredulity and was one of saying, you know, like they're saying, well, if you fix this, I'll come back. Like, no, you're not going to tell me, you know, this isn't even a problem, okay? And I'm not going to have you be in charge. Oh, let me, let me come and, and beg you to come back to church. No, because you're out of line. I don't have a problem in my household. I don't have a problem with the way I discipline my children. I don't have a problem with the way my wife disciplines my children. Okay, if one thing happens and you notice or if there's something getting out of control and you notice my kids are always being bad in church, let me know about it. Okay, I can't always see everything that's going on. And if you think there's an issue, how about you approach me and treat me like a father and respectfully say, hey, Pastor Burzins, you know, I've been noticing this is going on for a while. You might want to, you know, I'm, I just, I just want to let you know about it in case you're unaware. That would be different than saying, I'm not coming to your church anymore because you don't have your house in order. Yeah, and that, that's exactly the response I had. Oh, well, whatever. This. There's nothing, I don't know if I can help you. I, I've debated this. I've thought about it quite a bit. I don't think anyone in our church has a problem with the teaching on the discipline here. And I really didn't think that anyone <laughs> was going to be caught up with, oh, yeah, Pastor Burson just doesn't have his house in order. I really didn't think that for a second. Okay, I, I didn't. One, I was a little bit concerned about, well, maybe people are receiving accusations when they shouldn't, so it's a good reminder to say, hey, if someone's coming, to you. now, I don't think this person was doing that either. Honestly, I don't think so. I don't, I don't believe that. That could be wrong. But I do care, I, I even care about this person too, error of their way, and, and change their expectations of what you expect and, and how you understand the scripture here and, and, you know, I, when I was talking about the rod, okay, not using a rod specifically, well, well, this is striving about words, because what is a rod? I, wen I went back to the Webster's 1828 <laughs> Dictionary, all right, because that's the one everyone wants to use. You want to get a definition of the word, right? Let's go back and see what a rod is. Now, the Bible will tell you what a rod is anyways, because you have Aaron's rod that budded, right? You have Moses had a rod that became a serpent, okay? I don't see anyone disciplining their children with a staff, And I'm not saying that we're just saying that, I mean, you, how, how, how much do you want to get on this definition? Yeah. Around to the dictionary, 1828, the shoot or long twig of any woody plant, a branch or the stem of a shrub. So it's a switch. Yeah. That's what it is, yeah. right? You're, get, you're getting a flexible branch, right? This is what's being referred to as a rod that you can whoop the behind of your child. But you know, I don't see that happening. I, I mean, then everyone must be out of line, including the person who's making this accusation to me, because they don't do that either. 
well, how biblical are you? Oh, well, it's okay. So it's okay for you, but not okay then for me. So if I, if, I, if I don't have an instrument around me and I decide to use my hand to, sl to paddle the back of my, of my child's buttocks, then, then it's my problem. I'm way out of line for doing it, and that's unbiblical. Whatever. <laughs> well, it's funny because the Bible even uses other, we're chastened to the Lord, right? When we do wrong, believers, children of God. And he uses rods for us, but it's obviously not a physical rod. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to explain away all the, you know, the Bible's talking about the rod. But to try to narrow it down to just that one definition is nuts. Okay, go with the spirit of what the, of what the Bible's saying. Isaiah 11, verse 1, the Bible says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his root. So there again, you could get the, the definition of a rod being like a branch, right, from a tree. And then it says in verse 4, But with righteousness and equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. Sm we all understand that. He's smiting with the rod of his mouth. Second Samuel 7.14 says, I will be his father, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. So God say, I'm going to use a rod, but I'm going to use the children of men to be that rod. Okay, and I would say, you could use the wooden spoon to be your rod. Okay, the, answer, the, the whole point is that, that and not entering them because you love them but you're making it sting to drive the point home. So if I use a, a blind rod or, a, you know, something to that effect that you can keep under control and, and provide that sting, you're, you're doing what, uh, what the Bible's teaching. I've got a lot, I'm skipping over some of this stuff. <laughs> but the Bible, and here's the thing, it's not always just the rod, because the Bible talks about chastening that's outside of just using the rod, too. Okay, there is a chastening that you can give your child that is not, the only way you can chasten your child is just with a rod. Because the Bible says in Proverbs 19, 18, chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. Okay, but it doesn't necessarily have to be with the rod. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, verse 5, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of, of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, look at this, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Oh, now he's talking about a whip. That's what a scourge is. Oh, that's unbiblical too. Uh, is it? It's not a rod. Ridiculous. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if he be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. Almost done. De Deuteronomy chapter 8. All the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger, which means he allowed you to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Thy raiment wax not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. How did the Lord chasten the children of Israel in the wilderness? He allowed them to suffer some hunger. That was a chastening of the Lord, and he was teaching them something in the process, right? Hey, man doesn't live by bread alone, but everywhere. You follow me, you obey me, I'll take care of you, don't worry about the bread. 
I'll take care of you. But you know what? In order to teach them that lesson, they hungered a little bit. So you know what's another, I think, biblical way to teach your children something and to chasten them? Maybe if they're complaining about their food at night, you give them dinner. I don't want to eat this. You know what? You could go to bed hungry. And then, and then when you're hungry enough, that's, right. that's chastening. Yep. And that's chastening without the rod. Right. And you know what? I think it's perfectly biblical. I think we had a good example for that. And what's the point? You don't always have to. It's not a one thing only. This is the only way you discipline your child. It's not. It's not. That's one way of doing it. There are things you could remove. That, that Whatever the problem may be. This just, nope, you can't have this anymore. I'm taking this from you. You're going to go without for a while. That's a chastening also. We don't throw out the rod, okay? We use it. But we use it appropriately and, and use some sense about when do we use this and when do we not. And when do we extend mercy? So if you're going to look at me and look at my family and look at my household and say, oh, you're not... You're not using a rod every single time. I think you should use a rod. But you know what? Too bad. And if that's going to make you leave the church, then good riddance. One more bit of chastising we see in the... I'll read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 when it's talking about the Lord's Supper. Right? Corinthians 11, 27, the Bible says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. So for the reason why people are eating and drinking unworthily, God was causing them to be weak and sickly. That was a judgment of God. That was a chastising of God. And many sleep, meaning they died. And then it says this, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Okay, God chastens us in ways that he deems appropriate. And to take the cake with this, and if you're going to come at, okay, you better make sure you don't have a big beam sticking out of your eye, especially in this area. Like in the very area you want to condemn someone else for. Like you're going to come at me and say my house isn't in order with all subjection. You not have one of the rowdiest children in the entire church. You someone to listen to you, how about you get your house in order first right. and then start telling me how my house isn't in order? Yeah, 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 yeah. Bible seven one, judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? I'm not saying I don't say it. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm not saying there's not an area for improvement because there is. Okay, I'll admit, yes, can you improve your parenting skills? Yes. Can you improve your discipline of your children? Yes. Can you improve how well they sit in church? Yes. I can improve that. But if you want to help me with that, how about you get the big sinking beam out of your eye? Because I don't think you can see clearly at all what's actually going on. Instead of spending so much time looking at my family, why don't you spend the time looking at yours? Right, right, yep. And keeping them from running around all over the place during service and not looking at mine who are sitting in their chairs and you just don't like the look on their face. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, yes, these are factual events, okay? I'm talking real. Yeah. That's actually what's, what's being brought against me.
Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mope out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, out of thy brother's eyes. Look, I'm not above reproach. I try to be. But you want to come at me with, with my qualifications being put in question, you better make sure you've got a solid case. And if you're going to talk to anyone else about it, you better not receive it unless there's other people around to hear everything that's being said. Mm -hmm. So you can list out what is the accusation. Mm -hmm. And there's no question about it. There's no he said, she said about it. This is what's going on. So... As I mentioned before, and this is why I'm, because they're not kicked out of the church. Okay, I think they're, they're foolish. And I'm going to defend myself. I'm going to teach on this subject and make sure that no one is confused about this in the slightest. I hope not. I didn't think you were anyways. But, you know, at one thing I've learned being a pastor is that, you know, there's a lot of things that I never know. And sometimes things spread in churches and people talk and I have no clue what's going on. And that happens. So when I know about anything going on, I'm just, I'd rather just deal with it. Just bring it out in the open. You know, if there's anything else going on, you know, how about you? And, and you know, here's another thing too. And, and this ought to stick in your mind. Okay, last point. Someone wants to come and you bring an accusation against me. Ask them, have you talked to pastor about that? Right. Ask them first, because that might tell you where their heart is. If you love someone and someone's in error and someone's doing wrong, you can go to them and talk. You deal with them first. If you, if, if you see me having problems that you think need to be addressed, Please come and talk to me about them. Because I do want to know. And I'm not going to have good reasons, too. Okay, and if you're going to start accusing me of stuff that you are guilty of <laughs> to the extreme, you know, I, I'm not going to say I'm necessarily going change anything because in this case I didn't see anything that's worthy of needing change based off of every single little detail and accusation that was brought forth it was all stupid but I, I would like to know and if you have a problem you know if there's if I'm I struggle with and work on okay but if you see something and you you want to you know feel compelled that that I ought to be confronted about it I am not above, okay? Just do so appropriately and don't go talking about it to everyone else first. It, and that goes, not just me, okay, anybody. If someone's got a problem, you think someone's in sin, you don't just start gossiping about it. Why don't you love that person and talk to them about it? And yes, it's uncomfortable, but you know what? God ends behind their backs like that's wicked. Don't receive that. It doesn't fix anything. It's being a tail bearer. A gossip and a busybody. That's that those are definite sins. If you as you want to start talking about someone else's sins, now you're in sin. Way to go. How about you just just approach them? Okay. Otherwise, or, or if it's not worthy of approaching someone, then let them be and show some grace and mercy to someone who also isn't perfect. Because you don't need to approach everyone over every little thing that might be wrong in their, you know, in their life. Let them deal with it. Pray for them. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for mercy, dear God. We thank you for um, all that you give us, Lord. We, we are truly undeserving of, of all the grace that you show upon us, Lord. I pray that you would please help us to be able to judge righteously and, and consider ourselves. And um, Lord, that we, we 
we can do everything decently in order, especially in the church, dear God. And, you know, when I'm out of line, I want you to please just let me know and, and help me to understand these things. And, uh, and, and I want to correct them, dear God. And I pray that you would please just bless our church. I pray you please bless the whole week. Help us all to be traveling safely and that you would um, bless the, the soul in this afternoon. And, and God, uh, we just thank you so much for bringing all of us here together safely to, to serve you and to praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.